Ben, do we have a camera going? Okay. Thank you all for go uh, joining us today. I'm Steve Clements. I direct the American Strategy Program at the New America Foundation. And I'm very excited by, by today's program um, with a good friend that, that many of you know. In fact, I'm going to close this door. I don't care what we're doing. Um, Harlan Ullman, as many of you know, and maybe some of you don't know, uh, I call him on my blog the shock and awe guy uh, who conceptualized uh, in the defense strategic realm the concept of shock and awe. Uh, and then he, he shocked, and, and I was in, shocked me, and I was in awe of his criticism of the campaign of shock and awe. In other words, as he helped conceptualize this, he helped work with people like um, uh, Don Colin Rumsfeld. Powell, Don Rumfeld, uh, many others in helping to conceptualize a way to sort of think about a different approach to, to warfare. What unrolled in Iraq was, was not what he considered to be shock and awe. And it was out of that that Harlan Ullman and I became uh, interesting uh, and unlikely to some degree friends as we approach some of the national security portfolio questions and the questions of applications of force in the world from different vantage points but often end up right in the same spot and and today we may find that again uh, he I, I want to acknowledge some other things about Harlan Ullman he's a fascinating uh, behind the scenes uh, whirling dervish in national security circles I owe him uh, one of the most interesting opportunities I had to meet with a world leader who was Benazir Bhutto uh, just before she had gone back and met Benazir Bhutto at the Center for Naval Analyses uh, with Harlan. Harlan is a senior advisor for the, the Center for Strategic International Studies and a senior fellow at the Center for Naval Analyses, a columnist at the Washington Times. And today we're going to speak about <clears throat> the Pentagon, essentially, and what our obligations today look like, both in terms of uh, uh, deploying power, the various obligations the U.S. government has taken on for itself, budgets, uh, and, and the uh, architecture, if you will, of commitment and capacity that has him extremely concerned. Me too, but again, we're going to approach it from different questions. So I'm going to ask Harlan to come in, share his thoughts with you. I'm going to offer a few comments, and then I hope we'll have a very feisty and active uh, discussion. Thank you very much. Harlan Ullman. Steve, thank you very much. <clears throat> uh, the title of my uh, discussion is meant to be implosion at the Pentagon, uh, but today, given the weather, I think meltdown is probably a better term. Um, I would also just embellish my biography. Actually, I'm a senior advisor at the Atlantic Council, where I'm spending some of my time. And I'm also a distinguished senior fellow at the National Defense University, where I'm working on a couple of projects, including business transformation. In addition to that, I've been on the uh, advisory board of Commander European Command and Supreme Allied Commander Europe for the last five years, and I've been on the advisory board of Allied Command Transformation Commander and uh, Joint Forces Command Commander. So I've had some very, very intimate involvement in the subject that I want to raise today. Um, I'd like to note first that we have been there before. Uh, when Colin Powell saw the title of this lecture, he said, boy, have I seen that movie before. Uh, Dick Cheney, who is not popular with many people today, was a much admired Secretary of Defense way back in 1990 or 91 when, given the likelihood of a big defense build-down that was coming with the collapse of the Soviet Union, Cheney observed, every time we build down, we screw it up. And he's absolutely right. Put another way, building up military forces is far easier than building down. The looming challenges we face today, in my view, are both familiar and different from those of the past. We have arguably the finest military in the world. We are fighting two wars in Iraq and Afghanistan, and a third war, which was once against global terror, now against violent extremism. Depending upon how one counts, the Pentagon has an annual appetite of about 800 to 850 billion dollars to pay for all its good services and activities. But it looks like funding is only going to be something on the order perhaps of $650 billion and probably a lot less when these emergency supplementals stop. Now, whatever the size of that difference is, whether it's $100, $200, $250 $250 billion, it is a huge amount of money given a bureaucracy that has a rapacious appetite for funding. And I will get back to that in a moment. On the broader issue of strategy, we are torn, we are divided over whether we're going to fight and plan for big wars against Iran, China, 
refight the Folder Gap against a resurgent Russia, or small wars, better known as insurgencies, though that does not really fully define small wars. Now, Secretary of Defense uh, Bob Gates has made this distinction abundantly clear in a number of his rather excellent presentations when he has, for example, told the Air Force it's far more important that we have reconnaissance and unmanned vehicles than F-22s. And whether the sacking of Mike Wynn, the Secretary, and Buzz Mosley, the Chief of Staff, and their replacement will lead to an Air Force that looks at the world more diff differently remains to be seen. But the fact of the matter is the big Army, the big Navy, and the big Air Force are far more comfortable buying carriers and big submarines and new combat systems than they are with dealing with what is required for fighting an insurgency because really many people don't know and the kinds of equipment that are required are far different than these very, very largely expensive end items. Um, about people, as you know, the cost to, of deployments to our troops in human terms has been enormous. We're really at the ragged edge. Now, the decision was made to augment our ground forces by some 92,000 soldiers and Marines. In that augmentation, however, the only thing that was paid for was salaries. What was not paid for was housing, training, equipping, and the long-term costs of health care, retirement, and the like. And on top of that, it's by no means clear whether we can reach those goals of recruiting 92,000 people in terms of either quality or quantity. But the point is, we have imposed a huge lurking fiscal bubble that has got to be filled and it is not covered in any of the budgets that have gone forward so far. Last, the uh, cost of procurements of all major weapon systems for the last 10 or 15 years have doubled in real terms, have taken twice as long from initial inception until becoming operational, and have generally resulted and half the numbers from the original buy. If you take a look at the F-22, the F-35, the LCS literal combat ship, and the Army uh, future combat systems, what I'm now calling Ullman's Law, that you get half as many for twice as much and twice as long, has taken over. And if you don't believe that assessment, the Congressional Budget Office just released a report the other day that said that funding cost in real terms for procurement programs over the last 15 years has increased 100 percent cost, and funding to match it has only increased by about 50 percent. So that gives you an idea of some of these very, very powerful forces. Um, and none of this really talks about the cost of replacing or resetting all the equipment that has been destroyed, damaged, or worn out in Afghanistan and Iraq, which is really huge. So you take a look at this, and what you see are these centripetal forces that are acting on the Pentagon and the military that I think over time are going to have, I won't say catastrophic, but certainly an implosive impact if we are not prepared to do several things. And I will come back to that in just a couple of minutes. But I think before we talk about what needs to be done, it's useful to look at what Colin Powell referred to as movies I've seen before, or at least the trailers so that you get an idea encapsulated of what's happened when we've been in similar positions before. After World War I and World War II, obviously we demobilized. Uh, during the interwar years, two actions were really crucial in being able to provide the wherewithal that ultimately would be needed when World War II started. Intellectually, the Army, Navy, and Marine Corps really did their homework. And while you can read about training with brooms and lieu of rifles and the Louisiana maneuvers that were done without real equipment, or games that were held in Newport without ships. The fact of the matter is that <clears throat> intellectually, the military really used the inner warriors, and not just here, the Germans are probably even a better example, to think their way through about what would be needed. And the second was the Vincent Trammell Naval Axe, three of them from 1936 on which really put in place the basis of the United States Navy that fought and won in the Pacific during World War II. Now, what's interesting is that not one single capital ship had her keel laid after December 7th. They all were put down before September 7th, uh, December 7th uh, because of Vincent Trammell. Now, a lot of the cruisers were converted to carriers, and yes, of course, uh, 
the jeep ships, the jeep carriers, and the, and the escorts and the submarines were built after December 7th. But Vincent Trammell really set up the basis for building a fleet that was necessary. And one of the lessons we need to take from the interwar years is, first of all, the intellectual approach that's critical. And then secondly, can we find equivalents of Vincent Trammell so that perhaps in the future when we need to remobilize, if we do, we've got these things in place, but things that are not going to cause, cost huge amounts of money. Um, after World War II, our forces obviously became a shell. We went from 12 million down to, I won't say a handful, but a much smaller number. While we had the atom bomb, we only had a few. The Korean War completely surprised us. But less than three months, and I think this is remarkable, after we had been routed along with the South Koreans to that tiny little part in the southeast corner of Korea called the Pusan Perimeter, less than three months later, not only had we mobilized, but we had mounted the Incheon landing and routed the North Koreans. And had Douglas MacArthur not been necessarily so bold or had been restrained, <clears throat> who knows how things would have turned out. But the point was that we were able to come back in a period of less than three months, which was remarkable largely based on our World War II experience. The question is whether we will have that kind of capacity in the future when we see the next build down. Uh, the Cold War, Kennedy's military buildup to come uh, overcome the erroneous missile gap in Vietnam, sustained military spending, and really rejuvenated the United States military. Uh, strategically, as you know, while we relied on thermonuclear deterrence as the key underpinning for containing the Soviets, the services continue to develop their forces for conventional warfare. Very interesting. And if you go back and take a look, the Army was going to fight in the Fulda Gap in northwest Germany against the group of Soviet forces in a conventional battle. The United States Navy was going to launch the second battle for the Atlantic against the U-boat threat in the form of the Soviet Navy. The United States Marine Corps was going to operate on the flanks in Norway to secure the Norwegian flanks and the Turkish flanks. And, of course, the U.S. Air Force was going to provide not only air cover, but fighter support for the Army. All of this was based on a conventional war, even though strategic nuclear deterrence was really the linchpin. And this dichotomy in planning still persists today in a different form. Now, Vietnam began the emasculation of the military and ultimately led to the creation of the all-volunteer force as the draft became politically unsustainable. Um, by 1970, the stress of Vietnam was clear on the forces. And it was more than just what you may remember. In 1970, um, just as Vietnam had claimed LBJ two years earlier, um, the then CNO, Admiral Bud Zumwalt, was absolutely fixated on the danger he saw from racial unrest and rioting as the greatest threat to the United States Navy, far worse than the Soviet Navy all of which came from the Vietnam War and the after effects. Uh, after 1975, the effect of Vietnam was to create what Chief of the uh, Army Staff, General Shai Meyer, called the Hollow Force. This is a force that was unready, unprepared, unequipped to deal with future combat. And if you go back to the late 1970s, you can see the difficulties that we had that our equipment was not very good, that our forces was not very, were not very well trained, and our morale was not very high. And I can attest to that, having served in a number of units at sea and in operational conditions then, that what a really bad state of readiness. And that led, as you know, to a number of so-called military failures, <coughs> Desert One being one, Grenada being another, the bombing of the Marines in Beirut in 1983. I think that they were miscast, but they were certainly representative of the perception of the military being unable to do anything, which was not right, but it was a perception. By the time Reagan took over, the readiness and morale of the forces was extremely poor. Uh, defense spending soon soared, and that created over the next several years um, a pending defense train wreck, because as it would turn out, we had a third more program, or we were committed to buy a third more forces than the budget was going to allow. Interesting, what averted this train wreck was a funny thing that happened during the Cold War. The Soviet Union imploded, went away. So all of a sudden, the need for 2.5, 2.4 million people became overtaken by this particular reality. And the Bush administration began a gradual drawdown of about a third of our forces. Many people at the time, including myself, argued this was not sufficient. 
Now, from that time, we know what has happened. The Clinton administration came in, and the Clinton administration was pretty much steady as you go until, of course, the events of September 11th uh, manifested themselves. And at that stage, what we had was a U.S. military that was really a desert storm force on steroids. This was really the most amazing force ready to take on a conventional threat with extraordinary capacity, which we saw in Afghanistan and we saw this in Iraq. But the problem was there really merit weren't very, very major threats in which you could use this capacity. And more importantly, the nature of conflict and violence had shifted from traditional combat of like armies on like armies to a situation when the enemy had no army, had no air force, had no navy. And so how then do you begin applying this particular capacity to this type of enemy? That becomes the, uh, the issue. Now, one way we can do this um, is simply to spend more money. We can say it makes no difference. Um, what we can do is say whatever it takes we're going to spend, and that's what we need to happen. But I would argue that domestic pressures, economic pressures, and weariness with the wars in Afghanistan and Iraq are going to make that virtually impossible to do. So we have to think our way through. Now, how do we think our way through? If I were advising either McCain or Obama, and I'm not, I would start with a grander view of what should be our national security and foreign policy uh, strategies. And I think what we have to look at first is divining these in terms of what I would call shared interests. Shared interests are very simple. I think that there are very few countries in the world that are for terrorism, that are for environmental pollution, that are for instability, that are for a whole series of things that are just simply dangerous. And so I think if we look at this notion of shared interest and defining them in a common sense, it makes something that could be used to our advantage. I have called this in another book uh, the strategy of peace, prosperity through partnership. But if you take a look at all the bilateral, multilateral organizations to which the United States has affixed its signature beyond the UN, the Proliferation Security Initiative to bilateral, multilateral treaties, you will find out that they measure in the hundreds. But we have not been able to coordinate and use those. At the same time, virtually every single international institution has been a creation of either World War II or the end or the Cold War. And these, in many cases, have outlived their usefulness or need to be um, updated to deal with the current realities. We see that right now with the UN. We see it with the IMF. We see it with the World Bank. We see it with NGOs such as the Red Cross and many others. And so the notion here, if you look at the idea of partnerships, is to take some of the major partnerships. And in this regard, I would begin with NATO which faces an existential challenge in my own mind, trying to change from a military alliance against a military threat that has since disappeared to a security alliance based on broader criteria, to see how you can expand these relationships. One way, of course, is to look to linking up with organizations such as the Shanghai Cooperative Organization, which is Russia, China, and the four stands. But the point is that expanding this global reach around shared interest. Now, interestingly, in many ways, the United States Navy has taken the lead in this with its notion of a thousand ship Navy, better called maritime partnerships, in which what it wants to do is say, come on, anybody who wants to work with us at any kind of level, whether it's training, whether it's exchanging information, whether it's in operations, we will invite you. And the idea is to bring what is called maritime dom domain awareness, or rather that you know what's going on. Ironically, we know every airplane that's in the sky around the world all the time. We don't have a clue what's on the water, three-quarters of which is covered of the earth. And so the notion is let's draw on these partnerships in almost a voluntary sense. So you need a, a broad framework. Now, what do we do this in terms of uh, the U.S. military and what we need for our strategy? First, I would say in a strategic sense, we have to bite the bullet and make the choice between big and small wars. I would argue that we have to begin planning now for small wars, for insurgency defined much, much more broadly. That's not to say we can lose the core competency for large wars, but I think we can devote far fewer forces to these kind of high-intensity conflicts which would be fought against 
major conventionally armed adversary, whether that's going to be Iran, China 20 years in the future, or resurgent Russia, who knows? Now, striking this balance is going to be very difficult because we have a bureaucracy and a political system that is geared to be buying stuff for the big war. What do major defense manufacturers build? Airplanes, submarines, carriers, tanks, armored vehicles. What does Congress support in terms of appropriations? These kinds of things. So you're going to have this, this iron, this problem of breaking the iron triangle of Congress, defense, and the big war people. But nonetheless, you need to do that. Now, how are some of the ways that this can be done? First, I think that what we have to do, I would argue over the longer term, um, we're going to have to understand we're going to need fewer forces. And I would say over the next four or five years, partly due to budget crises, we're going to be down to a military of, say, 800,000 to a million. Now, you can argue if we withdraw from Iraq tomorrow, that may free up people. I would argue I don't think that's going to be the case because we're going to end up sending more people into Afghanistan, not in huge numbers, but I think more. And I would be surprised to see our forces below 50,000 in Iraq for some substantial time to come, which could be three, four years. So the notion of getting great gains here, it seems to me, is not going to work. So what then do you do? One way, one way is that we need to um, take some of our forces and put them in a stand-down or cadre status. We did this in the 70s. Uh, if the Navy wants to maintain 313 ships, it has 280 now. It seems to me the only way that it's going to be able to do this is to take some of these ships, largely submarines, and put them in a stand-down status where you don't have all the operational funding. The same thing is going to be true for the main force units of the Army. You're going to have to take some of these uh, corps that are designed uh, of, um, of, of tank and armor divisions and put them in some kind of a stand-down status. Um, we're also going to have to focus far more on education, as we did in the interwar years. And one of the things that we have to face is that we have these intellectual problems of dealing with a new enemy and a new threat, about which we have been, I think, not as fast as possible as we could have been in, in pursuing. So what I would argue is that we need to do several things. One, I would argue that the National Defense University needs to be turned into the National Security University. and it's student uh, size expanded dramatically so we bring in all arms of government. And I would argue the same thing at the service academies, that we might double the size of enrollment at Annapolis, West Point, Air Force Academy, Coast Guard Academy, to bring in more people who will serve throughout government. They would have the same kind of obligation if they don't go into service in the military. They would then uh, have a reserve obligation for some time. But the notion is to begin this intellectual um, development across government using the, uh, the military as a way to, to start. Um, finally, one of the things that we have to do is to cope with the uh, procurement issues. Uh, and that's going to be very, very, very difficult to do. One way is to start by reforming the acquisition rules and regulations by either codifying and then reducing them or reducing them or codifying them. A number of years ago, I did a study, and it was clear then that nearly 20 percent of the costs of uh, procurement could be attributed to excesses through regulatory and other issues that probably could be eliminated. And we need to take a look at this in a very, very harsh way. We've done this many, many, many times, and so far um, the results have not been as promising as they must be. Uh, there will be reduction over time in the size of our forces. The implosive strategic, fiscal, political, personnel, and structural purposes, pressures will mandate that. But if we're smart, this need not be an implosion. But that means unless we are prepared to tell the truth and understand the realities of action and inaction and do so without partisan biases and ideological driven lenses, as with every other time when we build down our forces, we will screw it up. And this time, in my view, we have neither the luxury or the ability to make a fast recuperation. So we better get this right. Thank you very much, Harlan. Um, that, that was an interesting survey of, of both our, our commitments and obligations on the security front and then, and then sort of a nuts and bolts treatment of 
everything from procurement to um, education reform, et cetera. But let me, let me try to approach this from a different arena and at a more macro level. Um, a colleague of mine here at the New American Foundation, Maya McGinnis, heads our, um, what's, her, what's the thing called? The Center for Responsible <laughs> Federal Budget. Uh, it's an appendage of New America. <clears throat> she has an um, exercise she walks through some of her people uh, with called an, a, a lesson in hard choices or an exercise in hard choices where they go through and they do what they did in that movie Dave of trying to look at the federal budget and then making hard choices between them and trading. Well, I sat down like other New America colleagues wanting to make Maya feel good that we were interested in this and uh, uh, went through. And the thing is, there were assumptions built in, as there are always assumptions built in. And one of the sacrosanct things we couldn't touch was the Department of Defense. And I found this fascinating because when you looked at essentially where one could have latitude, a lot of the incrementalism and the incremental growth in this arena was considered to be politically untouchable. That was built into the, into the exercise. Also up at the Poconico retreat, uh, I participated with the Rockefeller Brothers Fund once with a meeting uh, with a great number of people. And across the political aisle are people who had been long experienced in procurement in the Pentagon and others. Uh, Leon Firth was heading this, uh, Al Gore's former national security advisor. And we were trying to rethink, how do you rethink the security question and thus get out of the box of thinking about how we do it today, but how do we do it tomorrow? Where do networks come in? Where do the obligations come in? How did America use to achieve security? For instance, one of the things that wasn't re really reflected in your notes here is we used to do a lot less of what we do today. We didn't practice war so much. We had proxies. We operated through others. Uh, there's something very front line-esque about today's sense of military uh, issues. The Vietnam, of course, was an ex uh, uh, exception. But even in the Vietnam era, there were lots of others and their militaries and directions that America worked through. So we, we had this discussion. But it came down to a lot of the issues Harlan Ullman talked about, which was weapon systems purchases. And I remember one of the individuals there, who's now heading a, uh, um, a quickly emerging prominent think tank, said that, that it's truly magnificent looking at the Pentagon and what we're able to create at this fascinating, well-oiled machine of what it can create. And I, and I asked this person what the sort of annual mistake, if you were to go back and have gotten better choices in procurement and sort of anticipated, not have the inertia that you described as so much a part of the problem, but better yet, had you not had those errors, what would the dollar figure amount to? And she said about $30 billion a year. And which is, of course, the entire diplomatic budget. And since then, I found myself fascinated with, with, with one of the things, which is just very clear in the scale of numbers that Harlan is talking about, is that the United States, at the, you know, including supplementals, spends more money on defense and national security than all other nations in the world combined. That's not the next 20 nations, all other nations in the world combined, and yet Americans don't feel safe. There's a fundamental delivery problem of security deliverables in that, that I think needs to be thought through, and I think you're getting at some of the management issues. And where I come at it slightly differently is I think that we need to be bolder in thinking about either small armies or big armies, or, or big wars or small wars. I don't know if it's as easy because sometimes the threats don't come neatly packaged. Uh, we are organized for a certain kind of conflict, and we seem to be working hard at trying to engineer the threat that would help justify that conflict. But when you uh, uh, a former aide to David Petraeus recently said that, you know, what's happened around the rest of the world is you have countries like Iran and North Korea that are moving up towards nukes because that's an arena of debate. Then you have others that are moving down uh, into asymmetric warfare and others to try to work where they can because we so dominate that space uh, uh, in between those two and, and are not necessarily prepared for really the consequences of, of, of hyperproliferation or uh, we haven't yet organized around, you know, the sort of next generation of war, which is trying to fill the gaps where we are today. And, and I guess to some degree, <clears throat> I think it comes down to a fundamental question of how you think about the deployment of force and whether achieving our objectives. And I know this is hard to say, and I know many of you probably have much more experiences with it than I do with, with military organization and procurement and whatnot. Um, but what I do see is that the kind of mystique that America built up with the Pentagon to some degree depended on not using it. And Madeleine Albright's famous criticism of Colin Powell, I think, was a very important mistake, frankly, of attitude about the application of military force in the world because 
you use it rarely, you use it carefully, because if you ever demonstrate your limits, even with all the muscles you may be able to muster, you, dem you, 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 you show the world where your limits are, you shore the mystique off, and you lose your latitude across a great number of spectrums, both politically and economically and dealing with uh, treaties. And I think America is in a position and has lots of muscles. It has a lots of problems. But if we had not demonstrated our limits in, in, in Iraq, I think we would still be able to skate by a bit further, though I think we've been a superpower skating on thin ice for a long time. But when you show your limits as a superpower, recreating force and that ability to have leverage in the world is not easy, easily achieved, and it's almost never achieved through the pure application of military force. So then you have to ask, well, what do you do? Joe Nye calls it the soft power stuff. I hate the term as much as I hate the word global war on terror because I think it's intellectually lazy. It aggregates a lot of things together that perhaps ought not to be aggregated uh, to, to sort of think about how, in fact, you, you, you ratchet up your security deliverables and also the sense that America can achieve its re, uh, uh, results in the world, um, that it is not doing that through uh, aid, other, other kinds of uh, systems. But for all of the reasons that, that Harlan outlined, on the, the lack of clarity in defense and military objectives and then filling not, and, and an inability really to fill out that given the budget crunch that we face there, it makes us even less prepared to deal with the other side of the equation, which is actually get to the United States back in a position where it has more latitude, more leverage, and more ability to influence world affairs. Because I don't think we're going to enter back into that period of being able to take this, this you know, well-oiled uh, Pentagon machine and have that equate to a uh, uh, equivalent uh, posture and weight for the United States and global affairs very easily because of the Iraq experience is not just a win or lose in Iraq, it's because it's confirmed for so many in the world that we can't achieve results that we set out for ourselves. And it's one of the things I think is very important. And, you know, again, I'll finish with one comment. Dana Priest, Dana Priest wrote a really interesting book called The Mission. Uh, I hosted one of the first book events for it, and it was a fascinating exercise in looking at the modern military challenge. It dovetails quite well with a lot of what's in David Petraeus's uh, work on, on thinking about counterinsurgency and looking at the 80 to 90 percent of other stuff that needs to be done that is not, mili not military. And, and Dana's uh, conclusion in the book was that the Pentagon needed to become the nation builders. They were the de facto diplomats. They were the aid deliverers. That power uh, was through arms sales, as much as I think power by the United States is wielded by national debt uh, as by anything else. But, but to some degree, what's interesting is she was telling the world as it was becoming and as it is becoming in terms of the, the, the burden, you know, the, the, the sort of bundled up obligations that the Pentagon and the military has taken in the world because of the inadequacies elsewhere in the system that can't carry this set of responsibilities. I completely disagree with the prescriptive element of Dana Priest's book. It's not something that I'm comfortable with or think that should be happening, but I'm very much in agreement that it is happening, that the forces of gravity are taking us to a position where there are more and more obligations being clustered and bundled upon an already overburdened Pentagon. And so even I would say that the one critique I have, a substantial critique of Harlan's, it's not just big and small wars. It's all of the other obligations, even the soft power obligations, uh, in terms of generating global stability that the Pentagon finds itself tasked with, uh, if, if, if by nothing else than default, that I think needs to be part of a recalibration of strategic plan and, and uh, 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 to take us different where. So let me open up uh, comments and, and, and discussion, and I thank you for listening to my own take on, on some of your good <laughs> thoughts. So reactions, uh, questions, comments? Yes, sir. Stuart. Who's a DOD guy? Well, yes. Uh, Harlan, I'm trying to figure out six percent of the GDP is sustainable. Uh, no, I don't believe it is. Okay, I was going to get to that. Yeah. And I, 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 it's economically sustainable, but politically, it will not be. In I my view. I'm thinking of political. Mm. I, I guess I can understand it politically. I think you're absolutely right. But I also think that economically, because I think a number of recently we've seen that uh, a lot of this country's infrastructure. Uh, is going to require an extensive capital reinvestment. Uh, and I think the, the estimates that have been made are, are uh, actually understated. I think that the needs are going to be uh, enormous 
And at the same time, I think the, the world certainly is considerably more competitive than it was. I think the competitive advantages, many of the competitive advantages that we've had are being lost, have been lost, are being lost. Uh, and uh, that we're on something of a, if only temporarily, but perhaps even a longer term, a downward trajectory. And uh, so I- Because of the trade-offs of infrastructure, domestic infrastructure, infrastructure and then ETS. to add to that, things like healthcare and expectations of, of individuals that government will spend more, the social security crisis that's coming in the future, uh, and I suspect any number of other needs that we're going to be finding. And uh, the, the pressures then will not just be in terms of are we spending for distant wars that Americans don't like or don't even want to hear about, but where's the money going to come from for these other needs? You justify the implosion, <clears throat> and that could well happen. Uh, in fact, in many ways, I think some of the things, imagine oil, I wouldn't say imagine, what happens when oil reaches $300 a barrel? And that's not out of the question. And by the way, who is the biggest single user of oil in the country? Department of Defense. Yeah. Just think about, you know, the hundreds of billions of dollars that it's going to. So I think that all of this is, is correct. Uh, you didn't mention um, liabilities of pension funds, which that's are, right. which are right. a huge, uh, huge yeah. problem. So absolutely. And my point is, you can call that doomsday, you can call that worst case, but we need to start thinking, because we're going to need a strong military, and Steve is right that we need a strong national security team. Unfortunately, the Pentagon has become the de facto national security force because nobody else was capable of doing it. And it would like, part of the big versus small war is that people want to get out of that. And the small war is much, much more broadly defined than fighting wars, but it's doing all the things that you talked about, preventive diplomacy, that's why I mentioned peace, uh, the peace uh, partnership and prosperity, critical. Uh, what's happening in Iraq? I mean, the military is doing far more than military jobs. So without trying to be too frightening, um, you could see a real implosion because of these kinds of things. Uh, if you had heard the testimony of the uh, chairman of the Joint Chiefs, Mike Mullen, and Bob Gates before the Appropriations Committee two weeks ago, both Senate and House, it was amazing. Um, the defense budget and the supplementals went up 15 months ago, are just being approved now, which means you have to, you've got four months or three months left in the remainder of the fiscal year to spend 12 months worth of money. And to listen to Mullen and Gates tell the story, and Mullen used to be a programmer for the Navy after all, not only is this impossible, but the waste is huge. We're going to be wasting tens of billions of dollars. And so that is just a small. Wait, you're telling vignette. me that the actual cash has to flow. It's not just. You bet. It's not just. And you obligations. got to put these things. Nope. And because basically everything is funded for one or two years, with a few exceptions for R and D. And not only that, you got to let the programs. It takes a long time to write the contract. So you don't have enough people to do that. A lot of the money gets lost, and you can't be programming. We program. This whole system is not only arcane; it's broken. So obviously say obviously there needs to be huge reform in the appropriation congressional executive branch process which is not going to happen overnight so I can easily make a case that what Stewart says times three or four is you know four or five years ahead and it could be other comments questions this side you look official you don't want to ask a question no. <laughs> <laughs> yes sir um, I guess what I'm, I've, I've heard is a very broad discussion uh, right. covering a wide range of issues, whether it's procurement, <clears throat> strategy, yeah. DOD mission creep, and this stuff. And so I want to focus initially on the strategy, right, and procurement in particular, because I think you know DOD's medical costs, their pension stuff like that, is separate from some of the you know procurement and strategy issues. Right. The, the question and discussion that I'm particularly interested in is, is what do we want to do? And it's, I think, more complicated than just big and small wars. It's, do we want to have a six iron, a seven iron, and a six and a half iron? Um, do we want that in-between capability? What's our direction? Are we going to be invading countries in the future? Or is the DOD going to be doing construction and stabilization? Um, and I think those are the questions that haven't been asked at the Defense Department and haven't been asked at Congress. Um, and that's where I think you see this kind of drift in the procurement question is if the Navy wants 313 ships. What do they want 313 ships to do? Um, the Army wants future combat systems. And you see all down the services line without strategy driving program. Um, and I think that, at least on that side of the equation, the discussion we're having today, is the fundamental issue as I see it, 
is that strategy isn't driving the program. We haven't asked the right questions of what our strategy should be, and we haven't defined our program and our procurement issues to line up with that strategy. What's somewhat sad and just a quick response um, on, on my end is that <coughs> actually there was a discussion that had begun under at the very beginning of this Bush administration with Don Rumsfeld. In fact, he was struggling with this, and, and I frankly uh, was on in Rumsfeld's camp on the question of looking at sort of high flex, uh, smaller teams, more agile uh, deployments, because the old nature of you know when, when you when you sort of began looking at the competition with China, it was a very different dimension. But even that, even if you were to take China as your large national security threat, and then you were to look at your sort of rogue state elements and your concerns about missiles and say so we're going to solve that with ballistic missile defense and then you were going to move to a very different kind of uh, warfare in either a multipolar world or a unipolar world you still had the same same side and and to my understanding the art the, the armed services gave uh, uh, Rumsfeld a hell of a time and then 9-11 allowed both to proceed without a disciplining uh, function, but how do you see it, Harlan? I, I disagree with your premise, quite frankly. Um, there has always been a debate, and, and the big war versus small war characterization may seem simplistic here, but it has a much, much broader meaning. Uh, much more broader meaning. There has always been this bipolar nature, this schizophrenia. As I mentioned during the Cold War, nuclear and thermonuclear as opposed to conventional. We'd squeeze out the counterinsurgency stuff. And that's always taken its form. Um, in terms of the services, and, and the problem between what I would call the small war and, and, and big war strategic debate is not that there was no debate, there was no decision. That was the issue. There was no discipline. And the services were clever enough, and they had their constituencies on the hill and their constituencies in the defense industrial base. I mean, why the hell do we need new nuclear submarines? Why do we need so many F-22s? And the point is that the service culture is such that it was based on war fighting. I mean, what does Title X of the National Security Act say? To be prepared to conduct sustained operations incident to combat. It says nothing about nation building. It says nothing about all the things that they're doing, which is one of the reasons I think the National Security Act should be changed. And because of the amount of money that was thrown, one of the things you may or may not know is that cost was never an issue in the major procurement programs in this Department of Defense. Cost was never an issue. It's a striking reality, and striking that nobody took up with this. And so it needs to be disciplined. All right, so let's say you go to Bowman's plan for small wars, which is soft power, term you don't like, but doing all the things that nobody else is doing. How do you deal with the John Water problem? Prestigious, even though know, he's going to retire. Benefactor and supporter of the services, an elegant guy with tremendous prestige who says, I'm going to put a couple more submarines in the budget, or another aircraft carrier, or you take the equivalent. And so we are forced, because we can't buy anything else, to go to these systems. So it becomes much, much easier for the services to argue things that they can then apply, and then they can get the support to. And how you break it becomes very difficult. If you go back to 1949 and the revolt of the admirals, or the revolt of the, 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 uh, the colonels, and then the revolt of the it was just precisely this issue we could never reconcile. And so the only thing that's going to be able to happen is if the new administration, when the new administration comes in, it's not a question of having a debate. It's a question of saying, here's how we do this. And the reason I think that my approach is, is more likely politically to sell, you know, what I'm saying is you're never going to throw away, even though it's in hibernation, the conventional warfare side. You're just going to downgrade it. So maybe you only have two or three cores or two cores that are prepared to do that, the rest are doing other things. And what you want to then do is to pay the extra money to keep parts of the defense industrial base going, even though you may not be producing lots of ships or lots of aircraft, because there's going to be no, um, there's going to be no alternative. Remember, the price of everything we're buying is doubling in real terms. And on top of that, the Pentagon has lost the expertise to manage programs, and where it's contracted out for SCS or LCS, defense industry doesn't have it either. So you have incompetent management, which is also leading to these huge problems. So the answer is, you've got to make a choice that's got to be disciplined, and you have to use this whole idea of build-out, being able to do it, 
it's extremely difficult. It has rarely worked in the past, if ever. But if you don't, you're going to be work, work left with something worse than the home of force, in my judgment. At a time that you need it, not because we're going to fight big wars, but because I don't think the danger from jihadism or from instability has gone away. And quite frankly, the only tools that you have to deal with it uh, happen to be military tools because they're the best trained, prepared, and educated. So it's a grim assessment. Um, other questions? Yes, sir. Yeah, <clears throat> I have a question about uh, your focus on procurement uh, versus services. Um, while a lot of money is spent on programs and, and weapon systems, LCS is an easy target, FCS is an easy target um, for programs that have, that have gotten way out of, out of budget, it seems to me that the, by far the greater waste and the greater percentage of the budget currently, and especially the supplementals, is in uh, services. Um, and What do you mean that, by services? Um, any type of you know SBI net um, for the for DHS, mm -hmm. um, and these large service IDIQs were basically because we don't have the people to do work. Oh, sorry, I thought you meant the military service. I understand. Okay. Military services too. I mean, yeah. there's more contractors okay. in yep. Iraq now than there are than right. there are uh, guys in green, um, and and that's an area where the department is just terrible running programs. Right. They have absolutely no idea how to run those programs, and there's uh, it's very difficult. To do um, the KBR contracts are another example um, where there's just not a good idea of how to uh, do cost control, how to uh, understand budgets, how to um, you know, get adequate pricing data. Um, and it seems to me that there's there's far more more waste there. And if, if you're going to focus on small wars and those competencies, they're very people intensive. Um, so if the Army is going to go ahead and do Field Manual 2.0 and start doing Phase 4 operations, um, which is something that the State Department probably should be doing, right. but doesn't have the people to do it, um, that you're going to open the door uh, to even greater opportunities for waste as the uh, Armed Forces go into those soft power exercises that they, that's not in their core competence. Okay, I should add, because this uh, private side of the contracting business is uh, the New America Foundation and the Center for New American Security have a joint study group um, that's focused on that explicit thing. So they'll be issuing um, a set of papers and working groups along the lines of, of those questions. But I think they're important. I'm not sure they'll come up with good answers, but I did want to highlight well, the, that there's something going on here. These are, these are the dangers of privatization, and it's going to get worse. And, and as I pointed out, we don't have any real pro, uh, competent program managers in the Department of Defense because we've attributed things and we've privatized it. That's why I think the solution, where's all the money? All the money's in people. All the money's in people. And so that's why I'm arguing we're going to have to come down from 1.4 to about a million or less over time. That reduction of four or 500,000 people will free up huge numbers of resources. Now, are there going to be inefficiencies and waste? Absolutely. Absolutely. But I'm looking at a budget, perhaps, of 3% GDP as the future upper ceiling. And so how do you deal with that? And in essence, the only way you deal with that is with fewer people. Uh, it's going to take one of the things I've argued for is changing the acquisition rules and regulations, which would get into your privatization. So far, we've been able to do that. And I would guess, based as I said on previous studies, you could probably get 20% savings across the board if you were able to do that. But there are parts of the, of the system which are profoundly broken. Profoundly broken. Just getting reprogramming permission from Congress is, is often an impossible task. And it's going to be, I think, too difficult for any president or any administration to take all these issues head on. So what are the three or four or five big drivers? So I say the strategy making the, the choice between big and small, reducing people, being more innovative in the way that you have your forces uh, active or cadre status, and then putting a lot more money into education because that's where all the long-term benefits are going to be. And with procurement, we've got to move away from big programs, which is going to be very difficult because it's going to be incredibly resisted by an increasingly smaller defense industrial base. So the political problems are going to get larger. At a time when the other branches of government, the State Department, I mean, you really want to trust the State Department with doing all these rebuilding things? I mean, we managed to destroy AID. Uh, the intelligence community has yet to be rebuilt. We've got problems in law enforcement. Uh, the Department of Agriculture has been absolutely useless in, in, in places where they need to work abroad. We have all these things that have got to be rejuvenated, and no major plan to do it. So here's how I think that we could work this issue specifically in the Defense Department. So at the end of the day, we will be left 
with still a very, very competent, able fighting force that's be able to achieve the missions and not fall back to where we were in the 70s and the 80s. Yes, sir. Uh, Ed Berger, let me, let me address the issue of strategy <clears throat> and uh, ask a question about shared burdens, which I think one of both of you, in fact, talked about. And the sense of what you said was that we stepped in where we felt others would not, weren't willing or weren't able to do that. I sat through a session of the a delegation for the European Defense Initiative at the Atlantic Council a good five or six years ago, I think. And they came over here to say that, in fact, we should not be afraid of their being competitive with NATO. We should, we're not going to put them out of business. Uh, that they had a job to do, and it was in our interest to encourage them. They got, I think, no hearing at all in the United States. I had the strong impression that we, in some ways, don't want the Europeans, for example, to build up a defensive initiative. I gather we supply NATO with a good deal of its armament. We don't want to lose that market. It's the procurement issue again. Um, I'm not sure about what we are somewhat ambivalent about this issue of shared burdens, sharing the burden with others. I think the problem is, is, is far deeper and much more complicated than that. Um, the last two administrations have been extremely supportive of European defense and security initiatives. Mm -hmm. uh, the problem is that the Europeans are not only ambivalent, they're spending virtually no money on defense. So what you're looking at is a nascent capability, a capability which is not Deployable. Look at Afghanistan. Um, half the NATO members don't want to be there. They don't like the United States. Because the so-called caveats or rules of engagement, the Germans and the Italians are not going to use force except in extremis. We can't even get six helicopters. So the notion of relying more on the Europeans, whether it's NATO or the European Union, to do these things is something that we have been pushing, but it's been exceedingly difficult because of the nature of European politics. The NATO alliance as early as 2002 at the Prague Summit agreed to going to more of an expeditionary force basis. Um, and it's promised to do that. But NATO states have simply not been able to do that. So the problem in Europe is a profound difference in viewpoint with us. NATO is still a military alliance against a military threat that no longer exists. The big problem we have been pushing is to try to get NATO to become much more of a security alliance. I was there in February and March, met with the Secretary General, the North Atlantic Council, and the military committee. And in private, people say we have to do that. But it's impossible to. The way to start doing this is with a new comprehensive strategic framework for NATO. We have been pushing this at the Atlantic Council. And we're told by the Europeans, and the President had this at the Bucharest conference, that NATO's not prepared to do this until a new American president takes office because they don't want to upstage the old one, and by the time we get to that stage, they're going to be waiting for new elections in Germany to see what happens with Merkel. So there is a tremendous reluctance in NATO and the EU to take these tasks seriously. So on the one hand, it's important to try and have shared burdens, but the fact of the matter is Europeans are going to say we have 100,000 force troops deployed around the world in different places in peacekeeping things. Um, and we're not prepared to put forces up for these types of combat. That's a reality we have to face. So we have to be far more clever in how we do this. That's why, that's why I think that this notion of partnerships, moving NATO closer to the Shanghai Cooperative Organization, sharing of information intelligence, is extremely important because in the future, I don't think large numbers of forces are going to be needed. Selective numbers are going to be needed and selective skill sets. And if we can entice the EU to be providing more of these other capabilities, not military, along with other countries, that's what we have to, that's what we have to do. So there's an awful lot of scar, there's an awful lot of scar tissue that is, that's in place that makes what people say they want to do almost impossible to do. A security, if you didn't make news now, I don't know, whatever, but a security uh, entanglement with the Shanghai Cooperation Organization with Iran and Russia, exactly. and China, uh, and Turkey. It's, it's a big leap. Iran is it's, only, it's, it's very Obama-like. Is only, obama is only an observer, uh, but that's what we have to do. And, and by the way, this has been uh, rooted before. There already were NATO uh, outreaches to the Shanghai Cooperative Organization. No, and there should, there should be. It's just not Look, if you want to take on Iran, uh, Steve, you got to have China and Russia on your side, I, okay? I, I'm totally with you. Uh, other other questions, comments? Arnett? Are we going to take on Iran? <clears throat> yes. It'll be the biggest strategic catastrophe of our lifetime.
and I would say the betting is 50-50 before this president leaves office, he's going to say, I can't leave, you're on to the next guy. And as you know, that would be catastrophic. I wrote on a blog post this morning on, on that subject on the Washington Note, in which I, uh, I wrote a piece in Salon.com last September in which during a time where the climate was very, uh, both on the political left, I think largely for organizing against Bush, but also on the sort of neoconservative right, it was palpable the feeling that President Bush would, would bomb Iran. But everyone that I was talking to in the intelligence and the military circles was regularly telling me how wrong this was. Plus, we had this fascinating issue that I had written about where David Wormser um, had allegedly been out uh, talking about Cheney's frustration with having lost the internal policy battle inside the White House. What's interesting is in the last six to eight weeks, almost all of my friends who still remain in the State Department or the White House or DOD and some of these other sectors who were informing my views then have changed their mind, not about Iran, but what they've done is said that the tilt has moved the other direction, so that everybody that was losing, the sort of Cheney gang, the neoconservative gang, those who had a more strident view, they are now winning every policy argument from minor things that you would think are minor, like uh, legal provisions that would be more internationally palatable on you know, combat de detainee management or the law of the seas treaty, and then you can go on up are all uh, moving in a very different direction. And very few people have written about this shift. So I'm, I'm regrettably, I'm, I'm not predicting a conflict, like I'm not where you're That's at. That's what I'm saying, it's 50, Everyone 50, yeah, tells me yeah. that the, the, the diplomatic track, the crowd that was winning that Bush had given the tilt to, uh, tells me now that Bush has moved in the other direction. Is, what if, uh, I'm this, sorry? What if Israel decides to bomb Boucher? It's, it's a really interesting problem, and I deal with that because I said, you know, while I still don't think America will take reaction, what I worry about is the manipulation of an incident. It doesn't even have to be Israel. I mean, you could, what, I, what Fallon worried a lot about, <clears throat> what, what Fallon spent more time worrying about than anyone and sort of sending telegraph signals is, is looking at, uh, you know, field incidents or things that could happen within this sort of, that could, that could be manipulated as a spark that would have a fast escalation. I got written to, so I have some people going to Iran, and they said um, if they had, had an opportunity to tell the Iranians what they might do or propose in this situation, I said, well, one, the Iranian government, in my view, is not unified on these issues, and I think that there are, there are forces on, on around uh, the Iranian government who themselves think they would benefit from a conflict, uh, uh, as sad as that may be, but I think it's true. But I said, you know, one of the things that's missing that we had with the Soviets, we have with the Chinese now today, which you have with a very clear and specified threat of power, is the machinery at some level for conflict escalation management. And it is just totally missing with Iran. And, and I don't, it doesn't have to be a function of diplomacy. It's almost as if, you know, I knew Albert Wolstetter. And Wolstetter, who was a hard right-wing hawk, nonetheless, didn't want to see nuclear war through miscalculation and uh, es reckless escalation and spent a lot of time thinking about, you know, fail safe and a lot of the sort of contraptions and architecture of managing that. We're not doing any of that with Iran today. I said, you know, Iran would, would you know, win some major international PR, PR points if it, if it began initiating that kind of thing, even via Europe. Um, so I'd, I'd make two other observations. You read, obviously, that uh, Iran and Iraq have agreed to defense cooperation with each other. And secondly, uh, I'm not sure Israel has more, unless it uses nuclear weapons, which I do not think it will, more than a demonstrative ability to strike Iran. I think that they cannot, they certainly do not have our capacity. So I think any attack, any attack would be really quite limited. But it would be an attack. And, and, and that, yep. that, that, you know, a pinprick may be I understand. always needed. Is I worry, I'm worried about the pinprick. Everybody else is worried about decisions to go to war. And I think we need to worry about pinpricks. And what's really scary, and, and Arnold, you know these folks, the scariest thing that I saw was the boat incident in which our intelligence community has said publicly that it doesn't believe or it will not affirm that those voices were connected to the IRGC boats. That ought to scare the crap everybody. That means that you've got third parties out potentially trying to exploit a, an incredibly stressed, fragile situation. 
And again, almost no attention to that. What, what, did, what, what, were, what were we saying when we said that? We're saying, and interestingly, the, the fifth fleet you know, commander uh, has, has said we need an incidence at sea agreement with the Iranians to work mm -hmm. straight of Hormuz. Uh, he's had some heavy going, but it's a very good idea. There's a question. Yes. Yes. Okay. Well, I get three of you. Uh, first of all, Steve, I, I'm curious, um, like, what your understanding of, <coughs> of how there's a shift to the Cheney gang <coughs> winning, like, what's your understanding of that? And, um, I mean, I agree. You know, my impression is also um, that the drums are beating louder for Iran. And also, last week, I went to observe APAC, and, of course, every single speech that was the center piece of, of beating the drums. And one analysis I have is that if you want to go to war, that sanctions are a prelude to war. But for the, say, people who are there who might be more politically naive, um, believe in sanctions as a way to avoid war. So it's like, we're good people. We're not, we're not violent. We don't want to go to war. So we're going to do sanctions. And often they fail. Um, and then say, well, they failed. It's not our fault. So, um, and also in the research in conflict de-escalation, that positive inducements are more effective or maybe some combination, but emphasizing the positive, and this is all like punitive um, negative. So um, I guess my basic question is, if the drums are really beating and there's a strong intention to do it, what kinds of things can you imagine could prevent it from happening? <clears throat> on, on my part of the, uh, the question, it's pretty easy. It's that we all talk to people in this town, and we interview them, we discuss their views and attitudes, and my benchmark was simply the fact that when when I was looking at this from the period of April through September last year, there was a major shift in the White House and the DOD the, uh, at the disciplining function that Bob Gates brought to national security decision-making process, and much of this was not going reported. And you saw, for I think largely political reasons, both the left and, and to some of our friends at AEI and others, um, uh, try to affect the climate in various ways to, to begin arguing that Bush was moving towards a uh, decision to attack Iran, which seemed just completely at odds with the realities I was experiencing and seeing from people on the inside. My problem is today that empirically, without going through names, those same names <laughs> that on which I based a significant portion of my analysis before tell me that they are losing their battles today. Now, are they losing all their battles on, on attacking Iran? That is unclear to me. But there's a rafter of things that they that they are uh, that I think the president's tilt has moved in a different direction. And what haunts me is that two and a half years ago, I hosted a meeting with the Aspen Strategy Group out in uh, Colorado, and it was an off-the-record meeting. But I mean, you know, everybody from uh, uh, Dave Sanger at the Post and Mitch Reese, who'd been at State, Joe Nye and, and, and George Soros, but also uh, Bob Blackwell and others, a very diverse group of people participated in the discussion on Iran. And one of the individuals who said, who knew Bush very, very well, said that Bush, at the end of his term, just like, like Harlan said, would be handed a memo with a bleak binary choice. I'll never forget those words. And it was either going to be the peas or you bomb. And that there would be an effort before that to dance with the third option, to find the third option. I've written a lot about the need to find the third option. And that, that Condi Rice would spin round and round, dancing on the dance floor with the third option. And at the end, when they were finished, it would be a corpse. And then Bush would be left with this binary choice. And by the very nature, this was said two and a half years ago, very prescient, and said, this president is not the kind of person to leave that kind of problem to that. Now, this scares me a lot, because in, in, I'll let Harlan answer your next question, but on the sanction side, I think that that's, that's silly to be looking for the kind of classic buildup on Iraq. <coughs> I don't think we're going to do it. I don't think we have the time on the clock. If you read David Ignatius's piece uh, this week, uh, he seems to think that Iran has a strategy of running out the clock, and they may have. But if you're not anticipating that sort of manufactured conflict, where you're really doing, then you're looking at you need to look at different things, and almost no one else is looking for this pin prick or the sort of fragile uh, uh, moment elsewhere and how it be manipulated. And I'm worried about Fallon's move because Fallon himself talked about it repeatedly over and over and over again. There's been no more discussion of that kind of thing, except to some degree in quiet corners by Bob Gates. There are three, yeah, the, the, let me make three points because I disagree with, with, with Steve. The issue is not Dick Cheney. I think when the history of this administration is finally written, this is George Bush. 
Now, Bush is not engaged in everything, but Bush has the administration going where he wants. And in that regard, he's been a very shrewd, clever politician, I believe. And I think in many ways, Cheney is going to end up looking better than he looks right now. But I think Bush has really been extremely Machiavellian and very, very clever. And I think from the very beginning, Bush has realized he's had no alternative. Um, and so I think he is the one who's going to make his mind up. Second, the things that could block it. Iraq and Afghanistan have fallen off the radar screen because fewer Americans are being killed. But the situation in Iraq is not getting better. Yeah, violence has been reduced because of the so-called surge. The surge is coming down. But we still haven't dealt with the three profoundly difficult issues. The Constitution, which ensures Shia dominance. The mutual animosity, which is not getting better. The absence of reconciliation and the inability of the government to govern and divide up resources properly. And unless or until those things are going to be addressed, then Iraq becomes a real mess. And it's going to take a big explosion or something to see Iraq catapulted back on. And when we start bringing down our forces, that could easily happen. Afghanistan, in many ways, is, is in much worse shape. It's nice that Laura Bush could go to Kabul. But let me put it in this regard. Do you know who the largest producer of marijuana in the world is? Afghanistan. Now, when I raised this with a very senior NSC staffer who was in charge of Afghanistan, she said, you mean Colombia? And I said, no, I mean Afghanistan. The point being that the Afghan farmers are far from stupid. They're very clever. And what they said was it's a lot easier making marijuana, which nobody cares about, than it is poppies, because I'm going to get the army and the Americans and everybody down on me. There's nobody in charge in Afghanistan. <coughs> There's no unity of command. You've got divided command, not only between Kabul, but the US. Is it going to be CENTCOM? Is it going to be ISAF? It's going to be Special Forces Command. You take a look at development in terms of job creation, what's being done in terms of laws. There's still no property laws. What's being done with the police and all these other things. Afghanistan is, and is getting worse over the shared border with Pakistan. And even though the Pakistani uh, prime minister has gone over and they're trying to cut a deal with Karzai, the whole Northwest Territories Fatah is a, is a crucial issue here. Something is going to happen. Now, those two things could make it very difficult for an attack. Finally, two people, Bob Gates and Mike Mullen, who I believe would oppose an attack to the point of resigning. The question is, would they resign before or after? Because I think if George Bush wanted to strike, he would be clever enough saying, guys, I understand what your points are, but as commander in chief, I'm saying don't quit till after the attack. And I don't know what they would do because they would be put in the most impossible situation. You're more faith than I do, Benny. Uh, last uh, question, Arnold. Well, let me just take these no, two. No, I just uh, I was agreeing with uh, you, before you mentioned his name. That was the obvious name to mention to stop this would be Gates. Mm. I can't see Gates accepting to wait until something's happened and then resigning. If the president asks, I mean, he may not, uh, Arno, but when the decision is made, then Gates says, are you with me or against me, as he put it to Colin Powell. And I have no idea. I mean, it's not a reflection of Gates, who I think has been a, an awfully good Secretary of Defense with the right stuff. You know, Arno, but what, it's very difficult. If one, Colin one, had resigned. Yeah. We wouldn't be, th if Colin had resigned, we wouldn't be talking about Iran. Right. Okay. You know, Arno, you, you know, for those of you who don't know, Arnold DeBorschkraft is a very, very distinguished um, national security journalist, and you could, you could get at this. But what I found with Bob Gates, I asked people, what difference did, what is the real difference in terms of this shift that we saw last year? And what I learned was it was not just Bob Gates walked in with a different worldview. What Bob Gates walked in with was that he did what he used to do when he was deputy NSC advisor, is he began to subject what was a chaotic and blurry national security decision-making process, the interagency process, he's been meeting even with his deputies doing the same thing. Every meeting, what are our common understandings? What is the policy decision here? What is, you know, uh, uh, what are the two or three things here? Is there a consensus? Is there not? And this was not happening before. And that, the blurriness of the, of the uh, uh, decision-making or, the, or the, the interagency process was exploited, I think, by various players. And, and Gates simply brought that in in a very methodic way, and to some degree out Cheney Cheney, to some degree in my view, whether you think he's important or not, I think he out Cheney Cheney. I think what's interesting to, to know is if you can get someone to talk is,
I'm sure he's still engaging that discipline process, but now are the policy decisions that are commonly understood shifting? And I have a feeling they are, but I'm not sure. And don't underestimate the, uh, the influence of Mike Mullen. Mike has yeah. been a spectacularly good, uh, not necessarily seen publicly chairman in a lot of areas, and read his speeches. I do, but Gates, he's ratcheting Gates up. Gates has gone, era. you know, to make, give the speech at the, at the Air War College. Mike did the same thing at Carlisle. But you heard him at the Atlantic Council. Mike Mullen was ratcheting up quite a bit on that one. Not really. <laughs> yes. <laughs> Let me, ask, yeah, let me ask you your, your views on something that I think um, that I think undergirds all of this discussion, whether you're talking about the implosion of the Pentagon or Iran or anything else involving defense, which is the decision of how and when to use the military, use force right. in the first place. Uh, I mean, how basically the question is how should, who decides, who makes that decision, and uh, what criteria, other than the obvious, what criteria should it be based on? Um, that's a question that has no answer because you've got to put it in terms of specifics. I mean, obviously, constitutionally, the president in the last recourse is the person who can authorize force, though obviously local commanders have that depending upon certain rules of engagement. But you're really referring to this in a policy issue. And so take Afghanistan, Iraq, and Iran. In Afghanistan, there was consensus we had to do something. It was the question of whether we can do something that was smart. And when the CIA came up with this really interesting plan, how it was going to rely on the Northern Alliance. And remember, we only had less than 400 Americans in, in, in um, Afghanistan when Mazar al-Sharif fell. Then the president says, we're going to do it. With Iraq, the president decided, and I think that was a question of the president dragging people who were reluctant to go. And I, and I, and I think that, though I haven't read McClellan's book, I think he's what he's saying is accurate that the decision was made at least by the middle of 2002. In the case of Iran, it's going to be the president. And he then will maneuver because he knows he's going to face lots of opposition in the form of Gates and uh, Mullen and others. And how he does that will, be remain, will remain to be seen. But at the end of the day, it's the commander-in-chief commander -in -chief, and either he brings people aboard or as in Afghanistan, there was national consensus we had to do something. You know, you're either on top of the wave, swimming at a great rate of knots, or under the wave while it's crashing. Uh, but you're still the guy who has the call, and it depends on those situations as to how you make it. My, my only caveat uh, before closing is that, you know, President Bush, even President Bush in the decision to invade Iraq, and I buy the notion that this was preconceived and hacked a long way, spent an inordinate amount of time and effort in process ways with other parts of the bureaucracy, coaxing, cajoling, arm twisting. And, and it's important to look at that because even though I do think that they seduced the decision making system in inappropriate ways, nonetheless they felt they needed to seduce the decision making system. Because it's not an automatic decision without lots of other things. And it's why I think revisiting Goldwater Nichols looking at the national security decision making process, looking at the inputs on the intelligence framing which Tom Pingar uh, was here in this room talking about the other day, are very vital because Bush doesn't want to make it look, his legacy and these presidents don't want to make it look as if they completely ignored and broke and, 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 and were uh, uh, disconnected from their national security decision making process. And, and we don't, in my view, don't spend a lot of time looking at that. I find myself fascinated by the degree to which this administration on what I consider to be a bad decision, a manipulated decision nonetheless, really arm wrestled with its own people internally to do it because it felt like it needed them. And I think that's what we have to do. Let me make a final point. What Stuart said and what this gentleman over here said. The fundamental problem we have is that our system of politics and our government are both broken. Badly broken. You just look at the just look at the nominating conventions. And when you take a look at what's happening in the Pentagon, the same thing is happening in HUD, it's happening in just across the board. And what's interesting, and my column tomorrow writes on this, both Obama and McCain talk about change and reform. And the question is whether they are going to deliver. And if they are, they've got to start at the top, because we really have to shake up our government, because it's broken. And it's not because of bad people. It's for a variety of things, and that the political cholesterol has gotten so thick, because of the combination of culture, 
combination of our punch off or crusade and for this excessive partisanship which is just getting worse and worse and worse and worse that has got to be the starting point now if you can't do that then some of the fixes I have suggested for the Pentagon will be sufficient in a sense of triage so that you will still preserve some modicum of military capacity and not let it implode or erode but bear in mind we have a larger issue of governance and a larger issue of politics which one only hopes that this election will address and one is fearful that it may not. Well, I want to thank all of you, and I want to please help me in uh, thanking Harlan Smith. Fox is fascinating. Go ahead, fine.